I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. Okay, we got everybody in here now. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, so how's everybody doing today? Let's get to this. Alright, so let's look at some threads. Alright. So, nice. Alright, cool. Looking good, looking good. Okay, the picture's a little crunchy, but it's all good. Alright, so I'm going to show you guys this real quick. So if you have an image inside of 3ds Max you want to do and you don't want to render it, all right, so just so you guys know this. So you guys stop taking really blurry images, all right? I can save my viewport out. I can save this entire viewport out. So what I usually do is I'll hit Control and X at the same time. So let me, uh, let me turn on no board so you guys can see what's going on. So I'll, I'll hit um, if I you know if I find like I I like this view or something like that I'll I'll place it here and then if I hit Control X on the keyboard or is it Alt X? Well, it usually takes me into expert mode. Okay, expert. All right, so expert mode and I can then go into my my tools right here and then I can just in this view preview and grab viewport tab I can just capture a still right I want to make sure that I'm not hovering on it because whatever selection or whatever I have if, if it has that yellow it's gonna save it like that so I want to move off of that with my mouse or my cursor drag the viewport to the side right here and then name it boxy and then grab it so what that's gonna do is it's gonna grab my viewport and save it for us like a render and then you can just hit save and then you can save that to whatever location you want to save that to so that's just a little tip I wanted to give you guys uh, going forward because I know I've been seeing a lot of these and I'd like to see these just get a little bit better all right so that is that Let's go on to Mr. Jimenez. So far, okay. This was yesterday, so hopefully uh, you have something today for me, Elizabeth. All right, let's see. Dante, Emmanuel, nothing still. Okay. Yesterday you planned to work all day. Did you do any of the posting for the work you did? Uh, so I got to my computer and I and I kind of did like the first like I did like the first five minutes and I completely lost motivation. That was all my bad. Okay. Um. You know, you just you gotta you gotta power through those times, right? You gotta power through. Yeah. You know, if you're on a job. They're not gonna be like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, Disney, it's okay, Mattel. He lost motivation. He lost motivation, guys. Sorry, guys. Your movie's not gonna be on time. Your project's not gonna be on time because he lost motivation. That's they're you know they're just gonna fire you and find somebody who can do that. So there's sometimes you gotta guys if you if you guys are serious about it, you gotta take it like it's a job. They're not gonna allow you to just you know power through those moments right whatever shitty production you have at least you have something right and then you can go on and you know live to fight another day essentially live to fight another day do something even if it's a word you know do something do something right so that should not don't i don't want to hear i lost you you don't need motivation it's just making polys man all right so let's go to francisco Good stuff. So how are you guys finding the videos, right? Like, I, you know, because the stuff that you guys are coming up with looks pretty, you know, pretty 
close to what I did. Like, it, it looks like just like mine. So, um, for some of you guys, like, this is really, really working out. And I really, really appreciate seeing stuff like this. This is really cool work, man. Good stuff. Okay, Alexis. Looking good. Looking good. All right. All right. Our crates are coming along just nicely. Coco, unable to work till Sunday specifically, but I did see this, and this is pretty cool. So you've got this done. That's awesome. Looks good. Looks good. All right, you even went a step and gave us a little 360. Cool. All right, progress for today. Oh, this is Blender? Ugh. What is this? Why am I seeing all of this? I don't want to see this. I don't care. I want this image to be bigger in the middle of the screen. And you made a box with an inset. Wait, why did you make a box with an inset? Are you doing the low poly now? Before the high poly? I'm so confused, Maya. What are we doing here? This is Maya or, yeah, this is Maya. Yeah, what, what, what's, what's the idea? Okay, I'm confused. Confucius. All right, so you did one and you were like, mm. Bricks. Let me get some bricks in here. Uh, mm, let me find some wood and copper for my wood. For my crate. <laughs> I was like, let's make something dumb. I was like, you know what? Minecraft stone brick box. <laughs> all right, all right. That's interesting, man. All right. Uh, at least you're having fun with it, man. That's 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 good. Um, but. Yeah, let's let's get to the lighting part. That's what I want to see from you guys. Like like light it and render it, you know, so that it looks right, and then present it so that you know it'll it'll look good. But let's make this image a little bigger. But it's it looks good. Okay. It looks good. Let's make it bigger though. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff, guys. I'm you know I'm pleasantly surprised. I'll say that I'm pleasantly surprised at the amount of people that got to at least the high poly and then. Um, Hopefully we can get to that finish line. All right, so you finished part two, but you ain't post nothing. What? Okay, you finished it, but I want to see it. Angel, where you at, bruh? I'm trying to see it. I I'm need. Here. When are you gonna post for me, man? I'll post it today. Appreciate you. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, let's see. Angel. You hear? This looks good. Yeah. Looks good, looks good. Yeah, let's get to that. You guys are going to try to, you know, get that render done as soon as possible, right? So you guys can move on to that low poly. And um, so did you guys see if you guys had ZBrush or do you guys not have ZBrush on those computers? Let's see. There was no option. That was for the day before. Okay. Yeah, if the school computer, I think they have ZBrush. Even if they, if, if they did, that's, that's good. But if, if they don't, then we're probably we're gonna have to download them. And no, if you have to download it, you're not gonna be able to because you need permission. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, if they don't, that's fine. You guys don't have to do that ZBrush process. But I would like to at least see somebody attempt it if they can. If they if they can just attempt that ZBrush process. Cause it's a really, it's a, you know, it, it gives you a really cool um, render from that ZBrush process. All right, Victor, so you posted this like a year ago and we haven't heard anything from you. So I'll take that as it is. Payola, looking good. All right, I would brighten up your blue light a little bit. I'll bright, maybe bring up the, the um, uh, whatchamacallit, your Sky Dome a little bit too, but this looks good. This looks good. You got to this point, so you're ready. You ready for it. Um, the next idea I was having was maybe, because the low poly I originally made is a low poly that essentially acts as if the the crate is closed. And I think I might make another low poly video with it as open so you can open and close the crate. So that I'll be, I'll do that as like another option here in a bit. That So you guys can see, you know, if you wanted to make a crate that just is closed and then you can make one that's openable and then you can do like a little scene with it or something like that. So that's going to be uh, up and available as well. All right. So this looks cool. This looks cool. I'll just brighten that blue a little bit more and then uh, just throw these guys on a nice background or something. So, all right. 
I say it was finished, so it means Chris could be done today. Okay. But um, from what I see, it's very tiny. It's very, very small. Let's make this image bigger. Um, so that just to help my old, old man eyes here. Uh, yeah, it looks like you you got it. You're missing some, uh, some of the nails, but you need to. You know, you're probably close to finishing, but haven't finished. So, uh, yeah, just keep on keeping on and, and and get there. All right, let's see, Emily. Nothing for me. Jalen, nothing for me. All right. So yeah, thanks guys for uh, for that. That looked really good. Uh, a lot of what I saw looked pretty pretty cool. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing what you guys do with the rest of it. So today's class, what I wanted to do was um, get out of expert mode. So what I wanted to do was um, I wanted to take. Uh, some time and go over the first part of the PBR lecture with you guys. So I don't think we're going to finish it all today, but we will get through quite a bit of it. So um, let me get it to let's go to my drive, and um, you guys will see it here in a second. PBR. Light matters, light matters, all right? And don't forget to study for your um, for your quizzes either. Don't forget to study, all right? So PBR, light matters. So the reason we're doing this uh, PBR lecture now is because it's a very lengthy lecture. It's two parts and they're probably gonna take us, I mean, three classes at the least to kind of finish these out. So we're going to start it today. The quiz that you're going to have for it isn't going to be till next week, but that's perfectly fine because, you know, you've got the time and I want to kind of get you guys prepped up and ready for the whole thing. All right, so let's get it started. So the theory of physically based rendering and shading, right? So light is a complex phenomenon as it can exhibit uh, properties of both uh, a wave and a particle. Let me hide my no board for this. Uh, and it can act as a wave or a particle and as a result different models have been created to describe its behavior. As texture artists we are interested in the ray model of light as it describes the interaction of light and matter. Understanding how light rays interact with surface matter is important because our job is to create textures that describe a surface. The textures and materials we author interact with light in our virtual worlds. The more, uh, the more we understand how, about how light behaves, the better our textures will look. So in this guide, we will discuss the theory behind the physics of physically based rendering, uh, which is a, uh, in short called the PBR model. Uh, we will start by examining the behavior of light rays and work up to defining the key characteristics of PBR. All right, so let me move this little guy out of the way. This guy, let's just yank him and put him right there. All right. And let's lock him back up and let's move on. So when it comes to the light rays, the ray model of light states that a light ray has a trajectory of a straight line in a homogeneous transparent medium such as air. So essentially what they're saying is when light passes through air, it moves in a straight line. This is something you guys have probably heard in science classes of some sort at some point in time. Uh, biology maybe, uh, chemistry uh, even. Uh, so the, the ray model also says that the ray will behave in a predict predictable manner when encountering surfaces such as opaque objects or when passing through a different medium such as uh, from air to water. So when light um, when light bounces from the air, right? So like imagine you're seeing light 
and it's reflecting from a pool or you're underwater or something and you're looking at light rays, right? When it hits the water, it starts to break apart, right? This makes it possible to visualize the path of the light ray as it moves from its starting point to another point where it changes into another form of energy, such as heat. You know, if you leave light on anything for a while, it starts to get a little hot, right? Like if you're under like a heat lamp or something like that, right? Light produces heat. That's it changing energy. It's changing form, right? A light ray that hits a surface is called the incident rate, and the angle at which it hits is called the angle of incidence. All right, so this is what that looks like. So when a light ray comes in, like imagine like the sun or a lamp from over here, right? It's bouncing this light, light rays come out, it hits this surface, which is a, a polished metal surface. And what's, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna bounce right off of that, right? Some of that light is gonna be absorbed as heat, right? And the rest of that is gonna be bounced off and reflected in this reflected ray. And this, this angle in the middle, this is called the angle of incidence. Right? And what we do in 3D is we get the average, right? The average of these this point, right? Which is right here. And that's what we call our normal information. This is where we get our normal information from, right? When you bounce that light, right? The average of it, it's gonna bounce here. And then we get our normal from that. And then you have your angle of incidence, right? This is that angle right here. All right, so a light ray is incident on a plane interface between two media. When a light ray hits a surface, one or both of the following events occur. The light ray is reflected off the surface and travels in a different direction. It follows the law of reflection, which states that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence, which is called reflected light. The light ray passes from one medium to another in the trajectory of a straight line. As uh, at this point, light rays split into two directions, reflection and refraction. At the surface, the ray is either reflected or refracted, and it can be eventually absorbed by either medium. However, absorption does not occur at the surface of the material. All right. So when it comes to absorption and scattering, transparency and translucency, earlier, um, whenever we talked about um, substance painter and how we use it to make materials, I uncheck um, that transmission um, point where it, it asks if you want to bake um, the translucency or whatever. And I always uncheck it because if I don't have a material, I'm just wasting um, my, it's called thickness. Yeah, that's what it's called, thickness, right? There's a thickness, uh, you know, box inside of Substance Painter. And I always uncheck it because if I'm working on metals, well, my metal isn't going to have subsurface scattering. So when traveling in an inhomogeneous medium or translucent material, light can be absorbed or scattered. When light is absorbed, the light uh, intensity decreases as it changes into another form of energy, which is usually heat. It, it, its color changes as the amount of light absorbed depends on the wave, wavelength, but the direction of the ray doesn't change. When light is scattered, the ray direction changes randomly and the amount of deviation depends on the material. Scattering randomizes light direction but doesn't change its intensity. An ear is a good example of this phenomenon. Uh, the ear is thin and the absorption rate is very low. So you can see the scattered light radiating from the back of the ear, right? This is the, the figure that kind of shows that. So you can see a little bit of light kind of coming through. It's not completely transparent, but it's not completely opaque. So you get that. And if you uh, have like thicker webbing like me and some of the other fish people do apparently, um, you can see if you put it up to the light that there'll be some light that comes through the webbing, right? If you have, you know, webbing like me and you're a fish or something, but you know, uh, yeah. So you can definitely see that on fairer skin people. I'm a little darker, so it's going to be a little harder to see, to go through, but like there's, there's this, you know, clearer part that you can see when, uh, when subsurface scattering is occurring. All right. So, 
Uh, if there's no scattering and the absorb and the absorption is low, rays can pass directly through the surface like a piece of glass. Imagine like a piece of glass. Light would just go right through it, right? This is the case with glass, for example. Imagine you're swimming in a clean pool. You can open your eyes and see a great distance through the clean water. However, if that same pool is relatively dirty, the dirt particles will scatter the light and lower the clarity of the water and the distance you can see will be reduced as a result. The further light travels in such a medium or material, the more it is absorbed and or scattered. Therefore, object thickness plays a large role in how much the light is absorbed or scattered. A thickness map can be used to describe object thickness to the shader uh, as shown in figure three. So yeah, so this is what the thickness map does. And that's what I was talking about earlier, which is that thickness map that I usually uncheck because when we're making things like metal, it does not have any thickness or you know anything that needs absorption or stuff, something like that. So uh, that's why. All right, so uh, when it comes to diffuse and specular reflection, specular reflection refers to light that has been reflected off of a surface. As we discussed in the light ray section, the light ray is reflected off the surface and travels in a different direction. It follows the law of reflection, which states that on a perfectly planar surface, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. However, most surfaces are irregular and the reflected direction will vary randomly based on the surface roughness. This changes light direction, but the light intensity remains constant. Rougher surfaces will have highlights that are larger and that appear dimmer. Soft, smoother surfaces will keep specular reflections focused and they will appear to look brighter and more intense when viewed from the proper angle. Uh, usually a glancing angle. However, uh, the same total amount of light is reflected in both cases. All right, so you can see that in this um, in this diagram here that you know this is something that's smooth, super smooth. It's not. It's almost like a mirror a mirror reflection. It's almost a re mirror reflection in how it reflects the environment. You can see the environment very clearly in this one. And in this one, because it's a little rougher, right, what's happening is all of those light rays are coming in, but it's getting scattered. It's getting absorbed, right? You, there's little micro things. There's little little bumps and bruises and, and, and different things in there that's causing the light to reflect and reflect. And, and that's why the diffuse direction is going to start to vary, right? But if you have a smooth, very, very smooth mirror, like almost, you know, chrome surface, right? You're going to get the incident ray or the light ray, and then you're going to just get specular reflection, and it's going to be focused right here. So you're going to get a nice, nice highlight somewhere, right? This one is soft. You see how soft this reflection is versus how sharp and clear this one is. So that's how uh, light is behaving. And what you guys' job is is to reflect how, you know, use your textures to, to accurately depict how light would reflect on an object, and that's what PBR is going to help you guys with. All right. So uh, diffuse reflection is light that has been refracted. The light ray passes from one medium to another. As our example, we'll assume that it enters an object. The light is then re uh, scattered multiple times within this object. It is finally refracted again out of the object, making its way back to the original medium at approximately the same point where it initially entered. All right. So like I said before, it's going to, you know, come in here and then there's particles, right? There's particles in here and it's bouncing off those particles. So it's not coming right back. It's getting absorbed. It's getting scattered. And this one's bouncing into this one and this one's bouncing into that one. And they're bouncing around scattering how those light right rays. So it's going to absorb some of that. All right. So diffuse materials are absorbent. If the reflected light travels for a long for too long in such a material, it may be absorbed completely. If the light does exist, uh, exit this material, it has likely traveled only a very small distance from the point 
of entry, which means think about it. Just think about it like a thin, like a thin piece of glass or something, right? It, you know, uh, it might have a little bit of cloud, but like if it's thin enough, it'll just pass right through that bad boy. All right. So um, therefore, the distance between the entry and the exit points can be considered negligible. The Lambertian model, right? If you use um, Maya, you should know about the Lambert shader, which is what that. Um, uh, that model is based on, which is used for diffuse reflection in a traditional shading sense, does not take surface roughness into account. Other diffuse reflection models, such as the Orenmeyer or Nayer model, uh, do account for this roughness. However, all right, Mar uh, materials uh, that have both high scattering and low absorption are sometimes referred to as participating media or translucent materials. Examples of these are smoke, uh, milk, skin, jade, and marble. Rendering of the latter three may be possible with the additional modeling of subsurface scattering where the difference between the ingoing and outgoing point of the light ray is no longer considered negligible. Accurate rendering of media with highly varying and very low scattering and absorb absorption such as smoke and fog may require even more expensive methods such as the Monte Carlo simulations, right? That's why we simulate smoke, right? Um, and uh, the reason is because smoke is such... is is so hard to simulate how light would re react on it that people use, we've been using tricks in games like cards and stuff like that with like pictures of smokes from different angle and you'll have like an, emit, an emitter that emits them out and you just have like a transparent background on it. And when you do, but when you see it inside of movies, right, and ads and stuff like that, that stuff is actually simulating each of those individual particles and rendering those out for you, all right? So there's something called the microfacet theory, the microfacet theory. In theory, both diffuse and specular reflections are dependent on the surface irregularities where the light rays interact or intersect with a medium. In practice, however, the effect of roughness on diffuse reflection is less visible because of the scattering that occurs inside of the material. Uh, as a result, the outgoing direction of the ray is fairly independent of surface roughness and the incident direction. The most common model for diffuse reflection, Lambertian, completely neglects roughness. In this guide, we refer to these surface irregularities as surface roughness. Surface irregularities can have several other names, including roughness, smoothness, uh, glossiness, and microsurface. So, uh, Unreal, they call it roughness. Uh, let's see, I want to say Maya calls it smoothness, uh, maybe Unity calls it smoothness, but there's also a glossiness inside of uh, Unity, and you can change the the way it's rendering it based on what engine, engine you're going to be uh, using in it. And depending on the PBR workflow you use, which is I guess what I just said, uh, all the terms describe the same aspect of a surface, which is a subtextual geometric detail, which is like very, very tiny detail that affect the way light behaves on it. So if you look at this diagram over here, you can see what they mean by this micro, uh, micro facet detail, which is these little, little bumps that may be invisible to the naked, naked eye, but to the engine, to the computer, it has an effect on how your material is shading, and it's how um, the world works, right? There's micro facet detail in pretty much everything. If you look around you at all the objects in your house, right, and if you took a microscope, microscope or a uh, magnifying glass and you put it really, really close and you could get into the surface, you, you would see that there are all of these little micro facet and these changes in the direction of the surface, right? The only time you're going to get that that super smooth, super smooth surface usually is when you have something like a chrome finish or something like that, or a mirror, some kind of mirror-like finish, right? Uh, so a physically based BRDF or uh, is based on this micro facets theory, which supposes that a surface is composed of small-scaled, planar detail surfaces uh, 
of varying orientation called microfacets. Each of these small planes reflect light in a single direction based on its normal. All right, microfacets whose surface normal is oriented exactly halfway between the light direction and the view direction will reflect visible light. However, in cases where the micro surface normal and the half normal are equal, not all micro facets will contribute as some will be blocked by shadowing. All right. So you can see that if you look at this, you see some of it has highlights and it's a little darker where you have pits. Right, where you have like a, a pit right here and you know you're gonna get darker because you're having a shadow and the light may be bouncing here so that's gonna create a shadow right where there's light there's gonna be shadow somewhere right if you put an object in front of a light you're gonna create a shadow on the other side and that happens on a, almost like a, a, a very granular a very small level when it comes to a micro facet theory the surface irregularities at a microscopic level cause light diffusion for example blurred reflections are caused by scattered light rays the rays are not reflected in parallel so we perceive the specular reflection as blurred right so that's what i was saying is you know we're, this is how the shadowing works right so we're getting light but it's not it's going to it's not going to penetrate Right, so some of this stuff that, that's out here is gonna be masked. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about color. So the visible color of a surface is due to the wavelengths emitted by the light source. These wavelengths are absorbed by the object and reflected both specularly and diffusely. The remaining reflected wavelengths are what we see as color. For example, the skin of an apple mostly reflects the red light. I would add wavelength. So only the red wavelengths are scattered back outside of the apple while the others are absorbed. So what happens is light contains all of the, all of the visual colors in our spectrum. It uh, penetrates the object and what is reflected to us is, right, is that red reflected light and all of the other light colors all of the other light rays are then absorbed by that uh, object right so if it's an apple that's red right all of the other colors orange yellow green blue purple right they're absorbed and it reflects back to you that red reflected light and you can notice that if you have color blindness people will have issues differentiating between like greens and blues and different hues and things like that so uh, that's what happens when you're not getting the right wavelengths to come back into your uh to your to your eyes all right so the apple also has a bright specular highlight the same color as the light source because with materials that uh, that do not conduct uh, electricity, which are dielectrics like skin, uh, like the skin of an apple, specular reflection is almost dependent on uh, wavelengths. For these materials, the specular reflection is never colored. Uh, we will discuss the different types of materials, metals and uh, dielectrics in a later section. Uh, Substance PBR shaders use the GGX microfacet distribution model. All right, so um, we will be talking about metals and dielectrics later on, but I, th I feel like I've, I've said something about that in the past where every time we texture, we should be thinking about how this material is. Is it a metal or is it a non-metal? Will it conduct electricity or is it a poor conductor uh, of electricity? I'm not saying it won't conduct electricity. I'm just saying it's a very poor uh, conductor of electricity. So you will usually categorize your materials based on if it's a metal or a dielectric, right? So that's uh, that's just the basis of that. So you guys don't con go, don't get confused when somebody somebody says um, uh, like a metal or a dielectric material, right? Don't get confused. It just means it the the object is a poor conductor of electricity. Like you would be a poor conductor of electricity. Doesn't mean you won't get shocked or electrocuted. You're just a very poor conductor of it, right? Hence tasers. They still hurt, but you know, <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it, it, you're you're just not a good conductor of it, right? All right, so BRDF, all right. So yeah, I want you guys to remember this, right? This is gonna be on your quiz, right? BRDF, which is a bi-directional reflectance distribution 
function, BRDF for short, which is the function that describes the reflectance properties of a surface. Uh, in computer graphics, there are dif different BRDF models, some of which are not physically plausible. For a BRDF to be physically plausible, it must be energy conserving and exhibit reciprocity. Reciprocity refers to uh, Helmholtz's reciprocity principle, which states that incoming and outgoing light rays can be considered as reversals of each other without affecting the outcome of the BRDF. All right, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of very technical talk to say that essentially whenever a light reflects on something right it cannot reflect more light than it originally had so i can't bounce like 10 packets of light into an object and get out 20 packets of light right that's not how energy works i'm not going to create more energy when i bounce it from here to here you know that's not how it works what happens is it's going to either bounce the exact same amount or absorb some and bounce less right that's the laws of energy the brdf and that's what essentially this model is is helping us to understand without all of the the legalese, I would, I would like to call it. All right, so the BR, BRDF used by substances PBR shaders are based on Disney's principled reflectance model. Uh, the, this model is based on the GGX microfacet distribution, and the GGX provides one of the better solutions in terms of specular distribution, with a shorter peak in the highlight and a longer tail in the fall off, it looks more realistic. All right, so you know we've talked about this, and I always talk about how you guys should be um, thinking about that uh, that BRDF and how energy conserving materials. I know I, I went in on a rant yesterday about scan line in 3ds Max versus uh, like the physical material, which is an energy conserving material whenever you're using. Arnold or something like that and why Arnold really doesn't like scanline materials because they do things that aren't plausible in real life right they can bounce out more energy than than they than they receive right they can do things like that and and for some reason Arnold doesn't like that because it wants to be more physically accurate it wants to say this is how the real world will work stick to those rules and you'll be fine all right. But for sometimes you might want to have unrealistic materials doing unrealistic things, and that's okay if you understand what's going on. All right. So let's talk about energy conservation. Right. I always talk about this, and it's very important for the this kind of stuff that we talk about. And I've been trying to kind of beat it into your heads, and you know I talk about energy conserving materials and the PBR workflow all the time with you guys. And energy con conservation plays a, a huge role in physically based rendering solutions. This principle states that the amount of light re-emitted by a surface reflected and scattered is less than the total amount received. In other words, the light reflected from the surface will never be more intense than it was before it hit the surface. As artists, we really don't have to worry about controlling energy conservation. This is one of the advantages of PBR. Energy conservation is always enforced by the shader. This is part of the physically based model and it allows us to focus on art rather than physics. We're not physicists, right? We are artists. And as artists, I don't want to be, uh, you know, you know I, I like science, but I, I'm not going to major in, you know, photon packets and particles and stuff like that, right? I just want my stuff to look pretty and look good and, you know, that's, that's what I care about as an artist, right? So, uh, for you guys, you guys don't have to worry about that. And I try to try to give you guys a little bit of knowledge when it comes to 3ds Max because you're you'll wonder, oh man, why isn't it rendering when I have this scan line or something? You know, it's it's giving me all these errors. Well, because you're using a, a material that's not um, you know physically accurate. And it's not to like I'm saying like I'm saying it. It's not to say that you cannot use scan line materials, right? It's not to say, but you have to know what's behind it, what's really driving all of these changes and all of these these uh, effects that's going on, right? So let's talk about the Fresnel effect, right? The Fresnel reflection factor 
uh, also plays a vital role in physically based shading as a coefficient of the BRDF. The Fresnel effect, as observed by French physicist Augustin Jean Fresnel, states that the amount of light of reflected from a surface depends on the viewing angle at which it is perceived. I call that the glancing angle. Maybe not just I. I think that's an actual thing. Like it's probably it's not my thing. I'm pretty sure I learned it in school at some point. But it's called the it's a, it's also known as the glancing angle, right? Um, sometimes if you like look at an object at the, like the right angle you'll see like the reflection is like crazy. Like if you have, like I have a glass table outside, I have this glass patio. And there's sometimes when at the right angle, when the light hits it and I open the door, it literally just blinds me, right? At that particular angle, that light is so, so strong that it's just, it's just so blinding and it reflects it so well. Right. So think of a uh, think of a pool of water. If you look straight uh, down perpendicular to the water surface, you can see down to the bottom. Viewing the water surface in the in this manner would be at a zero degree or a normal incidence. Normal uh, being the surface normal. Uh, if you look at the pool of water at a grazing incidence or glancing angle, uh, more parallel to the water surface, you will see that the specular reflection on the water surface become more intense and you may not be able to see below the surface of the water at all, right? It may be so bright that you just can't see anything. And that happens. That, that's a real phenomenon. You guys have probably experienced it. You know, if somebody has like a watch or something, if, you know, somebody can flash it into your eye, right? At that angle, right? In your eye, you can't see nothing, right? So Fresnel is not something that we control in PBR as we did in traditional shading. Again, this is another aspect of physics that is handled by the PBR shader. When viewing a surface at a grazing incidence, all smooth surfaces will become reflectors at nearly 100% at a 90 degree angle of incidence. For rough surfaces, reflectance will become increasingly specular but, not, but will not approach 100% specular reflection. The most important factor here is the angle between the normal of each microfacet and the light rather than the angle between the normal of the micro, macro surface and the light because the light rays are dispersed in different directions. The reflection appears softer or dimmer. What occurs at a macro, uh, macroscopic level is somewhat similar to the average of all the Fresnel effects you would observe for the collective micro facets. All right. So when light hits a surface straight on or perpendicularly at pretty much like a zero degree angle, a percentage of that light is reflected as specular. So using uh, the index of refraction, which is the IOR, remember that term, the IOR is the index of refraction. For a surface, you can derive the amount that is reflected. This is referred to as FO, the Fresnel zero. And one thing before I leave this, before I finish, it's not called Fresnel, right? Don't say Fresnel. It's Fresnel, Fresnel. All right, so the amount of light that is refracted into the surface is referred to as 1 dash FO. All right, so this is the equation, right? I'm, I'm going to need you guys to solve this by, uh, you know, by, by 3 o'clock today. I'm joking, of course. This is just an equation for how it's calculated. So the FO range for most common dielectrics, right, uh, will be from about 0 0.02 to about 0 0.05. This is like a linear value. So for conductors, right, metals, the FO range will be from about 0 0.5 to 1. The reflectivity of a surface is therefore determined by the refractive index as shown in the equation below. All right, so that's the equation for how Fresnel is calculated. And different uh, objects have different IORs. So when I was first doing this stuff, we used to have to like have like a sheet or something for 
all the list of you know uh, F O's and uh, all the IORs and stuff like that and if you guys do a quick Google search you'll find that there's a list out there there's just a bunch of lists uh, where you can find that just you know you know uh, the gold silver and all that stuff so you guys can definitely check that out all right it's the FO reflectance value that we are concerned with in regards to authoring our texture non-metals dielectric or insulators will have a grayscale value and metals conductors will have an RGB value. With regards to PBR and from an artistic interpretation of reflectance, we can state that for a common smooth dielectric surface, FO will reflect between 2% and 5% of light and 100% at grazing angles as shown in this figure all right so at a grazing angle you're going to get a hundred almost close to a hundred percent right so you get about two to five percent uh, on that fresnel value all right so the dielectric or non-metal reflectance value don't actually change very drastically. In, in fact, when altered by roughness, the actual changes in values can be hard to see. Well, however, there's a difference in the values. In figure 12, you can see a chart that shows the FO ranges for both metals and non-metal materials. Notice that the ranges for non-metals do not deviate uh, from each other drastically. Gemstones are an exception, however, as they have higher values. We will discuss FO as it uh, specifically relates to conductors and insulators quite a bit later. All right, so let's look at um, some of these uh, these values. All right, so if you look at the, the, the values for plastic and rusted metal, I mean, it's, it's quite negligible, right? The, you know, th this, it, it's very small, right? Uh, the grays, it's a little darker here. This one's a little lighter, right? The only time it changes is when you're getting these metals where they have a uh, color in them, all right? So when creating metals for PBR, it's helpful to think in terms of metal and non-metal, like I said earlier. As you ask yourself if this surface is a metal or not. If it is, you will need to follow one set of guidelines. If it is not a metal, you'll need to follow another. This can be a, quite a simplistic approach as some materials may not fall into these categories such as metalloids, a mix of metal and non-metal. But in the overall process of creating materials, distinguishing between metal and non-metal is a good approach and metalloids are an exception. The, uh, to set up guidelines for materials, we must first understand what we are trying to create. What PBR, uh, with PBR, we can look at the properties of metal, conductors, and nonmetals, which are insulators, to derive this set of guidelines as shown in Figure 12. Uh, refracted light is absorbed, and the color tint of metals comes from the reflected light. So in our maps, we don't give metals a diffuse color. So metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, hence copper wiring and, and different things like that. The electric field in uh, conducting metal is zero. And when an incoming light wave made of electric and magnetic fields hits the surface, the wave is partially reflected. And all the reflected refracted light is absorbed. The, ref, uh, the reflectance value for polished metal is high at a range of about 70 to 100 percent reflective. So some metals absorb light at different wavelengths. For example, gold absorbs blue light at a high frequency end of the visible uh, spectrum. So it appears yellow. However, since the refracted light is absorbed, the color tint of metal comes from the reflected light. In our maps, therefore, we don't give metals a diffuse color. For example, in the specular gloss workflow, 
raw metal is set to black in the in the diffuse map and the reflectance value is a tinted color value in the specular map with metals the reflectance value will be rgb and can be tinted since we are working with physically based model we need to use real world measured values for the metal reflectance in our maps and that's what a substance really does for you right is another important aspect of metals is uh, in terms of texturing is their tendency to corrode right because what happens is they don't they're no when they corrode they're no longer uh, they're no longer metal right this means that weathering elements can play a large role in the reflective state of metal if the metal rusts this changes the reflective state of the metal the corroded area are the uh, are then treated as a dielectric material denoted by the black values in the metallic map as shown in figure 14. So what happens is we can no longer treat this as a uh, as a as a metal or as a as a metal conductor because it's not a good conductor of metal anymore. It's it's a oxidized metal, right? Um, and this the shiny part, right? It's white in our uh, metallic map, and then the stuff that the that, that's rust, right, that's been rusted away, is now treated as the opposite, right? As we'll discuss in part two, the shader in the metallic roughness workflow hard codes the FO value for dielectrics to be 4% reflective. Figure 14 shows the rusted areas in the base color uh, map as diffuse reflected color with a hard-coded F O value of four percent so also painted metals uh, painted metal is treated as a dielectric rather than a uh, rather than a metal so if you have like a ship and there's paint on it right that paint is not treated as a metal it's treated as a non-metal only the raw metal exposed from chipped paint is treated as metal. The same goes for dirt on metal or any matter that obscures the raw metal itself. As noted at the beginning of this chapter, it is helpful to ask if a material is a metal or not when creating PBR materials. To be even more precise, the question should also include information about the state of the metal, whether it is painted, rusted or covered in another matter like dirt or grease. The material will be treated as dielectric if it is not raw metal. Depending on weathering, there could be some blending between metal and non-metal. Also, weathering elements play a role in the reflective state of a metal. All right. So let's talk about non-metals, and then I think we're going to wrap it up there because we're coming up on the hour. All right, so nonmetals or insulators, which are called dielectrics, are poor conductors of electricity. The refracted light is scattered and or absorbed, often re-emerging from the surface. So they reflect a much smaller amount of light than metals and will have an albedo color. Uh, so that's what we traded out the diffuse for. We traded out the fuse for albedo when we come to the PBR workflow. We stated earlier that the value for common dielectric is around 2 to 5 percent. Based on the FO as computed by the index of refraction, these values are contained within the linear range of 0 0.17 and 0 0.067 as shown in figure 14. Apart from some non-metal materials such as gemstones, most dielectrics will, all, will not have a FO value greater than 4%. So with nonmetals, as with metals, we uh, we need to use real-world measured values, but it can be difficult to find the index of refraction for other materials that are not transparent. However, the value between most common dielectric materials does not change drastically, so we can use a few guidelines for reflectance value. We'll cover them later in the guide. The value for common dielectrics is about 2 to 5% based on the FO as computed by the IOR, which is what the index of refraction. You can see this uh, range illustrated in 
figure 15 right so here is our range so you're looking at about eight percent for uh, gemstones right and this is when it's in air right like this is this is uh, the the value it's about zero percent and then it goes all the way to about eight percent for gemstones all right so uh, let's wrap it up there today and we'll pick up tomorrow or uh, yeah, we will pick up tomorrow here at linear space renderings all right so does anybody have any questions so far I know this is this is going to be the most intense really part of um, my lectures and you know this is probably the most important parts of it too because this is the model that everybody's using now this is uh, how everybody's texturing everything and this is the guide from the people who essentially uh, have innovated and and you know they didn't I don't think they invented it but I think they have it um, kind of wrapped up and innovated on it the most all right so we'll pick up there tomorrow uh, if you guys don't have any questions, I have put up your uh, homework, uh, which is the drawing assignment, and I've uploaded the low poly and everything, so you guys should be good to go on that. So uh, go ahead, finish up your stuff, finish up your work, and I will see you guys tomorrow.